Welcome to Civil Net. This is your host, Eric Kokian, and it's my honor and pleasure to have as our special guest today a uh, very prominent Armenian from abroad, uh, Garo Pailan, former member of the Turkish parliament, noted human rights activist, and in my book, a freedom fighter. Welcome to our show, Mr. Pailan. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, as you know, we're sort of at a historic moment over the last few weeks. Uh, it's not a good history, but it's history nonetheless. And I know you've been in Armenia for a uh, a period of time. You've been to Sunik. So I wanted to ask you an open-ended question about Artsakh, about what your both intellectual and emotional feelings are about it. I just wanted to give you a chance to tell us what you think and where you're at. First of all, I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, to be sorry doesn't heal the wound of the people of Artsakh. We have suffered another genocide. When we say genocide, people think no, they ha there, there needs to be massacres. No, due to the uh, genocide convention, if you take an entity you know, somewhere and take them uh, from their roots and put to them to some, somewhere else, it's a genocide, unfortunately. Uh, but in the year is 2023, we didn't believe that this kind of a thing could happen. But I was expecting this, unfortunately because geopolitical balance have ch was, have changed 30 years ago, let's say, about Bosnia, world cared about Bosnia, and they stopped that massacre. But now, unfortunately, the world order has changed and geopolitical balance was not in our favor, but we didn't recognize it. I, let's say, came and warned the Armenian government in 2016, 2017, why? Because you know, Turkey also uh, lost its anchor uh, to the European Union process and start, uh, ended the peace process with the Kurds and started to use sophisticated weapons against Kurds. I saw this threat and, uh, and just established uh, be, be, be allies with Azerbaijan and uh, shared these weapons with Azerbaijan. And this, is a, this was a big threat, and we had to recognize it. We had to come to the terms or find stronger allies, but we couldn't find it. We just thought West would come and help us, or Russia would save us. We, uh, we just trust them. But I, I was expecting this, unfortunately, this war. We had to come to the terms of this geopolitical balance, but we didn't. That is why. This was an expected genocide for me that we lived. Sad but true. Sad but true. Uh, I'm going to move on to a second d directly related question. Uh, as it is very hard, given the, the nature of the two political systems in Baku and Ankara, those are essentially closed totalitarian systems on different ways and different levels. Uh, is the Ankara-Baku alliance, which at this point has actually been joined by Moscow in many ways, uh, depending on the situation, uh, how much of that is based on the relationship between the leaders or even personal or financial relationships? You know, there's a lot of companies from Turkey that, that are related to where they've gone that do work in Artsakh or other occupied territories. Uh, to what extent is it ideologically driven, I, this whole pan-Turkish ideology that you know, I think Erdogan is an opportunist, but he latches on to different things. Uh, and at some point, at some point, you don't even know who's the, who's the master and who's the servant based on how compliant Turkey is to Azerbaijan's needs, possibly because they really don't care about Armenia either way anyway. Uh, tell us a little bit, can you enlighten us about where do you think this relationship comes from and what's the actual nature of it? You know, uh, Erdogan is an opportunist uh, and he doesn't care about any kind of values. He, does, he only cares about his power and the transactional relationships with the West or Russia or China or Israel doesn't matter. He only cares about his power. That's it. And he is benefiting from this balance game between Russia and the United States and West. Now, and Russia-Ukraine uh, Russia war really helped Erdogan because he was so vulnerable. But after that war, you, Turkey has become a more important country and uh, they are just uh, selling goods to Russia, buying cheap natural gas, and they see Western appeasement, unfortunately. So um, let's 
look to what happened a month ago. Uh, Erdogan went to Sochi, met with, let's say, Putin. But I hear that they spoke about Caucasus. Mm -hmm. And they, there was a, sen a scenario written by the Russians, I'm sure about it almost. Uh, and, they, and just the day after that, uh, Arik Arutunyan had to resign and there was a you know, election period. And uh, <laughs> accidentally, uh, Azerbaijan started to deploy, deploy arms or army to the, to around Nagorno-Karabakh, Arsakh. This can't, can't be a coincidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, Russia just gave uh, Arsakh to Azerbaijan. But in return is what? We have to ask this question. In return is, I think, to just uh, get rid of Pashinyan government. Mm -hmm. That is what it is. And I'm unfortunate that nowadays we are seeing that uh, now Zengizir corridor uh, issue has been raised in the Turkish media. And nowadays, uh, Azerbaijan is as asking for their enclaves, so-called en enclaves. This means further escalations. This means further threat for Armenians' territorial integrity. Under these circumstances, we have to see this threat. But unfortunately, I don't see that when there is this kind of an existential threat to the motherland, which is our last uh, uh, chance uh, to survive, uh, let's say, nations unite. But I don't, unfortunately, I don't see this unity. No, we, we are a democratic nation. We can criticize Mr. Pashinyan. It's so normal. But you no, know, if some part of the nation's only aim is to, let's say, get rid of Mr. Pashinyan's government, that is in, that would be in favor of this Russian plan. So we really need to face this and we need to unite against this. I only care about Armenia and I came here to really convince my people to unite. And for this, all, Mr. Pashinyan has to make a call on the nation and we really need to unite again to avoid this existential threat. Yeah, I think there's a uh, there's a thing that people don't understand. You can you can oppose a regime without opposing the state. Exactly, because you know, uh, five years later, three years later, we'll have another elections. If there is an, a better o o offer to the Armenian people, I'm sure they are going to elect it. But if we lose the democratic ground, we will not be able to yeah, uh, no, uh, no. Do, do it. And we can be a country like Belarus, and uh, we are we all going to suffer it. In the, we lost the first republic like this. When we were fighting with Azeris and Turks, we lost the first republic in 1920s. Now, there is an existential threat about it. We need to be aware of it, and we need to unite very against much it. So. Uh, I'm going to move on to a very uh, sort of a distinctly parochial political issue. Uh, under uh, likely Western pressure, this government has gone out of its way to establish relations with the Turkish Republic. I obviously support full diplomatic relations without any uh, preconditions and opening the borders. It's have, it'll have its issues, frankly, economically, but uh, it's an eventuality, no matter how you look at it. Uh, and it's something that needs to happen. Uh, this country has put its uh, hand out, this government, sending aid during the earthquake, uh, while Turkey was the only country in the world that essentially openly supported the blockade and the aggression against Artsakh openly. Uh, after all of the everything that this government has done, uh, it has essentially led to absolutely nothing. Now, uh, this is not a surprise. Many of us thought this was a, a show, a political show more than anything. But why do you think that is the case uh, that when at a time where almost every historic precondition for relations has been met, and you have a government that is most favorable to this, that the result of it has been absolutely nothing? I think it is not nothing, first of all. I was with that rescue team in Adiyaman and uh, worked to together for, for 15 days, and I was there working uh, in the earthquake zone, and really people were very shocked about Armenians coming to rescue Turks or Kurds 
in Anatolia. So it, 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 it was really helpful because when it comes to a humanitarian issue, we should have this empathy. But unfortunately, Turks uh, didn't uh, show this empathy to the, to the uh, Arsakh uh, people when they were suffering, unfortunately, because of the media. They, they all have been brainwashed during the, those, because in, there is a you know, payroll in Ankara, which uh, Azeris are doing, and they are just uh, using this propaganda machine against Armenians. I believe peace is a necessity for Armenia, but it is not a necessity for Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, Aliyev, would never be in favor of peace, because it will be the starting point of its end. The beginning sure of the end. The beginning of the end of Aliyev regime. When, because they are benefiting from this, this hatred. So to be in favor of peace is not a bad thing. But you no, know, uh, we have to be uh, pursuing peace, but we have to be ready for war. But we are not that powerful. If you are not that powerful, you have to be clever. No, but no, we are not that clever at, at all, I have to say. Uh, there is an existential threat, uh, and Moscow have written this scenario, and uh, we have to find a way to convince Turkey to change its policy. Because Turkey doesn't have a policy, uh, independent policy about South Caucasus. So uh, to change it, I think, from the Western world, there needs to be a pressure over Ankara and Baku to uh, convince them to be in favor of peace. Because the West, unfortunately, what I see in DC now is, you know, they don't want to hurt Azerbaijan. And what is happening in uh, Israel and Palestine, uh, it, it is going to make this argument even stronger because Iran is an issue and they will not uh, want to hurt Azerbaijan at all. Uh, so, and we have to uh, see this, that we don't have a leverage. We have to build the leverage, and our biggest leverage is our nation all over the world. We have people in United States, Europe, France, and Russia as well. These people should convince their you know, government to put pressure over Turkey, to play a constructive role on South Caucasus, and to, to show a red line. There is no red line. We have to see this. Even Azerbaijan attacks Armenia. And they will only, let's say, US is only going to go to UN and for a resolution, which means nothing you know, in this you know, ter terrible world old order. So, so li just like they showed that, that red, red line to Russia, because of the Ukraine war, before the war, if you attack Ukraine, we are going to impose these set of sanctions. We have to convince United States and European countries, Brussels for that. But Brussels is not getting ready for it at all. Because instead of buying natural gas from Russia, I, can, I will buy natural gas from Azerbaijan. This position has to, has to change. And Brussels and Washington need to show this red line and they need to convince Ankara because they have only a transactional relationship, tit for tat, and money F-16s for this. So uh, they need to convince Ankara to change its position, to convince Baku to sit and sign this peace deal. Peace is a necessity for us. We need some time to be stronger, to be independent, because our dream is independent, strong Armenia. We are not independent, unfortunately. We are so dependent to Russia. We need to be, uh, we need to have some time to be independent and we need to be, get that point uh, to just uh, save our country or to, to, do, to be able to secure our borders. For this, we need at least five years and with this peace deal, I think we'll be to, uh, to that point with a functioning economy in five years. Yeah, I think uh, um, I think we want to. Uh, uh, the other point we want to make is that the uh, Azeri oil, Azeri gas, to, uh, uh, Europe is entirely exaggerated, and it's a point that we constantly. Yeah, it's make. only one or two yeah, percent. But ridiculous. even Americans don't know it. No, you they, know? Yeah, they, they think it's uh, it's uh, ten yeah, to twenty percent. They've, they've done a fantastic job so of selling the line. Really, we need to only also lobby about these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move to a very Turkey-specific question. And I've spoken to other. Turkish colleagues, friends, uh, associates, 
uh, and many of them, and these almost tend to be almost entirely from the opposition uh, or from the liberal end of the Turkish political spectrum, uh, most of them believe that was there ever really a chance that Erdogan would lose? Uh, even if he had lost, he would leave. Or, the, or is Turkey at this point not a functional democracy in the way that you can actually have regime change through the ballot box? That, that is, that, is that, that, has that Rubicon been crossed and this, this, this sort of uh, Turkey becoming slowly some Sunni Iran? Is that inevitable? Or is that, has the democratic moment passed? There was a chance. There was a real chance. But unfortunately, you know, opposition made a big mistake. You no, know, to just uh, have a rivalry in Erdogan's you no know, uh, strongest muscle, being a nationalist, they say. Erdogan has a nationalist partner and following nationalist policies. And opposition tried to be nationalist, just like Hitler's you no know, opposition. And if you oppose Hitler in a nationalist way, you lose. Uh, uh, that, you're not the real thing. Yeah, it's not a, a real thing. So uh, they lo be, uh, as the opposition, unfortunately, lost the election. And no, uh, remember Abdulhamid regime and uh, that and Turkey also opposed uh, that Talat or Enver Pasha's in a uh, nationalist way. And uh, Tashnaks were uh, no allies with them. What happened at the end was a disaster as well. So there wouldn't be, we'd, we wouldn't see even the opposition won a real change. And unfortunately, after this election, I think Turkey is a lost case uh, for a midterm. No, uh, because media is not functioning at all. Judiciary is not functioning. Institutions are not functioning. Only there is transactionalism, Erdogan's interests. So maybe we need to think about it also. Uh, being a lost case doesn't mean that we can't have relations with that kind of a lost case. Iran is a lost case, but we have relations with Iran. Russia is a lost case about democracy. We have relations with Russia, and we have to know how to we know how to deal with these kind of authoritarian regimes, and we have to uh, find a way to find uh, to have relations with Turkey. We are really uh, we we are. We might be so close to peace as well at the same time. So we need to be ready for it to find the uh, best slash solution of the worst scenarios, maybe, to have a peace. And we ha when we have peace, we will have an open border, uh, which will benefit Armenians, Turks, Kurds, and Azeris as well. I believe you know, about this corridor issue uh, as well. The, it, it is. Uh, real, it has been. It ha, they made. They are making it a, it's a big, big issue. That's why. But I am trying to convince Turkish government. No, let's work on a project. That really, uh, which will be beneficial for Turks, Kurds, and Azeris. This road, but no, um, to have a demand about that sovereignty of that corridor m means you don't want peace. So uh, this means. Let's say in the 1990s we had maximal demands. Let's say it was a barrier in front of the uh, of a peace deal. Now Azeris have the same demands. So Turks need to convince somehow Azeris or the Western countries need to convince Azeris about sitting at the table, signing the peace deal, opening the transportation lines, and with that, really, we need to uh, all nations can benefit from that. But I think Aliyev is not at that point at all. Yeah, no, no, it's not. Uh, his regime dies the moment the peace. Yeah, exactly. The because other these people then will ask about their rights. No, no. Why am I poor in this no oil, oil rich country? They are in fact the poorest people in the Caucasus. Exactly, the unfortunately. Uh, I'm going to close with, <clears throat> since I know you have experience with the West, uh, and what I found out, what I still notice is that uh, in Washington specifically, on some corners. Turkey is the Turkey of 1985 that's run by generals that are pro-NATO with, you know, with wives with blonde hair and blue eyes that you have dinner with you know, in beautiful restaurants in Istanbul. But that Turkey has ceased to exist a long time ago. In almost every... Uh, uh, to what extent is that change real? That the fact that, that essentially the Turkey that was created by uh, uh, Ataturk has essentially been transformed into a, a, a completely other entity that is actually, in its core essence, anti-Western. 
uh, i.e. it sees the West as a threat to its own uh, rise as a power or is distinctly anti-Western. Do you see the same thing that I see in the sense that the, the view of the have of Turkey is really not based on current realities, it's actually based on a fantasy of what they expect or a, or a reality of what there was? Uh, what do you think about that? I think Erdogan is following the same policy that Atatürk did, you know, that's that balance game. Uh, let's say uh, after the Bolshevik re revolution, Atatürk had benefited from the Russians because Russians didn't want uh, you know, the Bosphorus to be in, in the hands of uh, you know, Brits or France. So they, uh, B Bolsheviks helped uh, uh, Atatürk. And just then the Brits said, oh, please, appeased Atatürk about uh, everything. Just, oh, don't go to Russia. I'm going to help you about it. And they uh, just uh, left uh, Greeks in Anatolia. So this, uh, this balance game has been played by Atatürk and for 100 years, I guess, they are playing the same game. Only there was a period when uh, the fear of communism and Turkey uh, was the member of NATO. Then Turkey is playing this balance game and I, I think they are going to keep on playing this game uh, until the end. So we need to see this as well. West or Russia? will not hurt Turkey at all. They will not care about genocides, human rights violations, which has been going on in Turkey against Kurds and so many human rights activists. So there will be a full, full appeasement of Turkey. And, so, and uh, there will be a full appeasement maybe of Azerbaijan. We have to face this and we, ha we don't have so much leverage. We have to build the leverage. Our biggest leverage is our nation. We have to focus on it. And we need to really unite here because this geography is going to create huge earthquakes after now. And for maybe decades, it, these regions are going to be unstable. We have to face this. To get rid of this, we, it, we need to have a short-term peace deal. It, it will have, of course, uh, price, uh, but we need to face this as well. We lost this war. We need to have this uh, peace, which is going to guarantee our territorial integrity. And of course, with Erdogan's uh, you know, uh, vision about you know, transactionalism or benefiting, and we need to show him that this, with this project, the eastern cities of Turkey will develop, or Armenia or Azerbaijan with these roads. We need to show him as well to convince him. So this might be a way to convince Erdogan and to Western countries as well. But Western countries, we need to convince them to show Azerbaijan a red line. We don't have that red line, which is a biggest threat to our nation. Uh, Mr. Pailan, thank you for the conversation. Thank it was you very a pleasure much. having you. Thank you for joining me at Civil Net.